Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Biofilm Diversity and Ecology, presented by Matthew Fields. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented and sponsored by LabRoot, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, please go to www.labroots.com. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Matthew Fields. Matthew Fields is a professor and director at the Center for Biofilm Engineering at Montana, uh, Montana State University. He previously served as interim head of the microbiology department, now the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. He heads CD's Physiology and Ecology Lab, where his research is focused on metabolic and genetic processes of microbes and biofilms. These organisms can be involved in nitrate contamination, heavy metal remediation, metal corrosion, and bioenergy production, among other areas. He earned his doctorate in microbiology with a minor in biochemistry and biological engineering from Cornell University. Fields earned his master's degree in biological sciences at Mississippi State University and his bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry at Western Kentucky University. Fields has won numerous awards and journal editorships including the MSU Award for Excellence and the Wiley Award for Meritorious Research. He currently serves as specialty editor for the journal Frontiers in Microbiology and academic editor for the PLOS One, and he is research fellow at the National Center for Genome Resources in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Mr. Matthew Fields? Thank you, Christina. So as Christina said, I'm at the Center for Biofilm Engineering at Montana State University. Um, and I wanted to give a, a quick outline of the talk that I'll be presenting today. And so one, when we, when we talk about biofilm, we're talking about microbial biofilms. And so I want to give a, a quick um, synopsis of microorganisms and the role on the planet and what are biofilms and what do we mean by a biofilm? Um, why, why, do, why do biological systems, particularly microbial biological systems, produce biofilms and why they're important to study? Where we find them, um, which is in a myriad of different environments on the planet, and, and what do we know um, thus far on, um, for microbial biofilms and who's there uh, in, in reference to the ecology of those biofilms? And so this, uh, this image here that you're looking at is actually the, the campus of Montana State University in the, in the backdrop of the Bridger Mountains in Bozeman, Montana. So real quick about the Center for Biofilm Engineering. Um, we're now in our 26th year. We're uh, originally were funded by the National Science Foundation as part of their engineering research uh, center program. And our mission is to promote and conduct interdisciplinary research and education um, dealing with biofilm research. And a big tenet of, of what we do at the center is to transfer our biofilm knowledge to help solve industrial, medical, and environmental problems. And so we have a tripartite mission of research, education, and outreach. 
And a big part of that outreach is technology transfer and actually interacting with industrial companies. So as I mentioned in the outline, I want to give a, a quick, um, just catch everybody up to speed. I know we have uh, different folks with different backgrounds and so about microorganisms. And so uh, microorganisms are predicted to comprise the largest amount of biomass on the planet and they, all, they play pivotal roles in ecosystem function. And just about any imaginable planet or any imaginable environment on the planet is going to contain microorganisms and they're going to play in very important roles in the functioning of that ecosystem. Um, on top of that, they represent an immense, um, as yet undiscovered, biochemical capacities. And so we, we know that we've barely scratched the surface of identifying what microorganisms are out there, um, what organisms we can cultivate in the lab and actually have genome sequence for. And so the, what we think we know about microorganisms is really based on a small percentage of the ones that we've been able to study in the lab. And we know there's a lot more out there. Um, and there's a lot, meaning that there's a lot to discover and a lot to learn about, about even carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, and phosphorus cycling, and how microbes play a role in that. So uh, a lot of good biochemistry. Microorganisms, as I mentioned, dis di di dictate global biogeochemical processes for the cycling of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus for almost every environment on the planet. And actually, it's estimated that microorganisms contain about half of the organic carbon on the planet and the other half being uh, residing in plants. And then they also contain the majority of organic nitrogen and phosphorus on Earth. And so that means that most of the nitrogen, most of biological nitrogen and phosphorus right now on the planet resides in the microbial realm of the planet. Micro, so, so in summary here for this slide, microorganisms play an important role on the planet and they're very plentiful and there are lots of different environments and they do many important things. So this is looking at a tree of life based on 16S and 18S genes, um, a common biomarker to compare all the uh, different types of life forms on the planet. And so we have the three domains, bacterial, archaeal, and eukarya. And when we think about this, this tree of life and, and all of life as we know it right now, and here's where we are in the animal, uh, in the animal kingdom within the domain of eukarya. And if we really think then about the, this tree of life and, and and what is large macroscopic organisms and what's microbial, the vast majority of this tree of life is microbial. So this means that the vast majority of life on the planet is, is microbial, they're microorganisms. Irrespective if you're thinking about, about the domain bacteria or archaea or eukarya. When we think about multicellular large animals, we're really at the, we're at, we're at a minority when we think about the tree of life. And so this states that most of life on the planet is microbial, and most of that life probably exists as biofilm. And so typically this is thought of as, sometimes you'll see this referred to as a mode of attached growth. And so when, when you think about a, a biological organism and it's going to attach to a surface, that's going to be synonymous with this term biofilm. And, we, and what's Typically, the paradigm in biology right now is that most of this microbial life is existing in a biofilm mode or as a, on a, a life or a, a form of life that's going to be attached to a surface. And so by this attached mode, what we mean is, is that microorganisms exist as self-organized communities attached to surfaces and to one another, and they're going to be surrounded by a self-produced extracellular polymeric substance that can contain a, a wide variety of biological and non-biological compounds. And so by non-biologic compounds, I'm meaning anything that's going to, any sort of, of chemistry or chemicals or anions or cations that are going to be present in that environment. And by biological compounds, I'm meaning um, certainly cells, but anything, then any type of macromolecule that's going to be produced by those cells, be it protein, lipids, carbohydrate, um, polymers thereof, or nucleic acids. And so there's going to be this, they're basically a self-organized uh, community that have lots of different microbial populations in it, and they're going to be sort of surrounded in this matrix that's made up of lots of different biological compounds. And so then this, this term, or this phrase, attached mode, really is synonymous with a biofilm. And this biofilm then is, is, is just what I had, had stated as a self-organized community, and it's sort of on a surface. 
Now, by surface, um, we can think of these these phase boundaries as, as in a variety of, of um, states. And so when I think about a surface, it could be between a liquid and a solid, it can be between a liquid and a gas, or it can be between a solid and a solid. So really, any type of phase boundary where there's going to be moisture and there's going to be nutrients involved, you're going to find microbial biofilms in that type of environment, and there are going to be a multitude of physicochemical um, conditions. Um, if we can think about all the different types of, of environments on the planet that are going to be able to have these phase boundaries between solid, liquid, and gas. And even looking back into the fossil record, um, it's been reported in the literature that actually we, we have remnants of what looked like microbial biofilms all the way back to three and a half billion years ago. And so these are evolutionarily ancient forms of microbial life that probably played a role in the evolution of life itself. And even today, it's usually estimated that the vast majority of microbial populations that are present exist in a biofilm state, some type of a state where they're, they're attached either to each other or onto a liquid or a solid surface between these phase boundaries. So then by, by definition, and, and there are lots of working definitions for what a biofilm is, and this is one that we typically use at the center, but there will be certainly others, and you can there are variations of these definitions. But as I stated, it's, it's a, a group of microorganisms living in a self-organized community attached to surfaces or interfaces or each other or all the above, and they're embedded in a matrix of extracellular polymeric substances that they've made themselves, and they exhibit altered phenotypes and behavior compared to free-living planktonic cells. And so by free-living planktonic cells, I mean organisms growing in a free, in a suspension, in a liquid, how we usually grow them in the lab. And so those, that type of environment is going to be very different when we think about this notion of cells sort of coming together and aggregating together and then living at these phase boundaries. We're starting more and more, we're seeing that the that, that type of biological system has a very type uh, or a very different type of phenotype and behavior. And these images then, and I'll, I'll hit some of these in the next couple slides, are examples of how we can think about biofilm. And this image on the bottom is actually a confocal image that was taken at the center um, that shows the, the 3D structure of, of this biofilm. And so they can be very large, they can be small, they're going to scale. Um, they're going to have large scale variation in different sizes and dependent upon the organisms that are present and the types of environments that they find themselves in. So this is an example of a, a, conf, a, a different type of confocal microscope image and, it, and it's sort of signifying a multi-species environmental biofilm. And so a lot of the times we go into the environment, these, bio, these microbial biofilms are going to have lots of different organisms in them, lots of different morphologies, and we can stain them in different ways to sort of highlight the, the diversity that were within this biofilm. So this is a biofilm that's been stained with a red-green fluorescent DNA stain. Um, so any intact cells then they are going to have DNA, are going to be able to fluoresce with this stain, and the field of view here is, is uh, 250, square kilometer, uh, two, 250 square millimeters at 630 times magnification. Now, in, in comparison, this is a, uh, an, a confocal image where you can see it, it's actually a monoculture. It's a single species of an organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, this is a common soil and water uh, bacterium, but it can also be found in the human environment. And this is a, a typical type of, of biofilm that you would get from a Pseudomonas um, bacterium that shows, again, you sort of have these this low-lying flat area, and then you get these mushroom or haystack-like structures um, that, that sort of come up out of the horizontal plane of the biofilm. And you can then use this confocal imaging to get the 3D dimensions of a, of a biofilm like this. And again, this is at 250 square millimeters at 630 magnification. So this, the next two graphics will sort of uh, depict the formation of biofilm and the transition states be, uh, be behind how a biofilm forms. And so at some point, you're going to have to have a surface. And this, let me uh, come down here. And so if you look down here, you're going to have some type of phase boundary between a liquid and a solid state. And you're going to have microorganisms that are in this planktonic state. They're in the bulk phase of that liquid. And they're going to come into contact with that surface. And they're going to colonize it. And at which point, and you can already start to see a difference in these cells, at this point they're being shown to have these 
flagellar structures and they're motile and they're thought to come into contact with the solid surface at which point they're going to typically or at least the based on the systems that are typically studied for biofilm formation those structures of motility are lost or are altered and they start to chip to build uh, produce different types of cellular structures that are going to allow them to to become sessile to stay in place and interact with this surface and interact with each other and during that process then they start to accumulate this what starts to 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 be an initial biofilm and they start producing this matrix that's going to start to encase the biofilm cells are going to start to divide and they're going to build more matrix they're going to change the proteins and the carbohydrates and the lipids that they're producing and this biofilm then is going to start to communicate with one another and it, and this can be either for a monoculture biofilm or for a mixed species biofilm At which point then they're going to start to form what's called these micro colonies and that and this is going to be driven by then cell division of the different cells and you can imagine then as this biofilm grows and this the cell number increases the matrix that's encasing these cells starts to increase you're going to start to get chemical gradients that form meaning that whatever type of mass transport from the bulk phase that the cells are going to need and whatever this waste products the cells are going to have inside the biofilm and they need to get out there's going to be gradients that are going to start to form and the, and the, the cells are going to start to um, respond physiologically to those gradients that form in the biofilm. And so in essence, when you, when you finally get to this stage, it's being seen here and what we're going to have as a, as a mature biofilm, there's going to be what are considered micro niches. And that's being shown here by these different colors. Um, you're going to have different organisms within this biofilm that, that's going to show heterogeneity. These different cell types are going to be doing different things and they're going to be responding to the gradients of things coming in and things coming out. Go back. To where ultimately you what you what you we would get something that that's being depicted here as this mature biofilm. And so the the biofilm has grown it's reached a somewhat steady state with mass transport of nutrients from the outside and nutrient and waste products coming out and it's going to start to be let go of cells and this is what's called seeding dispersal and so cells are actually going to be start to be released and those cells then are going to go and colonize in a new environment and start a new biofilm this can also be another way that this can happen is through this these structures up here at the top of the screen uh, biofilm streamers or that you'll actually get these uh, dislodging of these large aggregates that can go and move um, to different places in the environment and initiate new biofilm. But ultimately, keep in mind that when we, during the formation of this biofilm and in reaching the state of a mature biofilm, there's a lot of heterogeneity within this biofilm. And so almost start to imagine that um, what we typically think of for microbes as being single-celled organisms they can form these biofilms and in essence become multicellular macroscopic. And so I think this was this has ramifications for when we think about the evolution of biological systems. I, I mentioned that the center the, for biofilm engineering where I'm located is, is a very interdisciplinary research center and that's because of the, the heterogeneity of what a biofilm is. And so because of, of the micro niches that are formed in this biofilm and the chemical and the biological gradients, you can imagine that you have to have um, experts in microbial ecology, microbial physiology, microbial genetics, genomics, and biochemistry, as well as, as engineers that understand flow transport, environmental engineering, and civil engineering, and bio, biological and chemical engineering, um, as well as for any, bio, like as with any biological system, bioinformatics and statistics. And so you sort of need um, expertise in all of these areas or individuals that are experts in these different areas to really start to, to tackle what biofilm is. So I hope I've described um, what, what biofilm is, but why, why biofilm? And I can think of this question in two ways. Why do microbes exist as biofilm would be the first question. And so we know microbes are important on the planet. We know that my, most microbes are going to exist as biofilm. 
We know that biofilms are, are self-organized microbial communities that exist at interfaces and they encapsulate, can, uh, encapsulate themselves in a, in a self-made matrix. But why do that? And so if we take a step back and think about most microbial environments, these are physically dynamic environments where fluxes in water and nutrients and temperature and pH, osmolarity. Think about any sort of geochemical or geophysical constraints that the system is going to have uh, um, inherent to it and the microorganisms are going to have to respond to that. And a big one in this is dehydration. And so we know that dehydration events or water limitation events can inhibit motility, they limit nutrient availability, and in essence they can um, have a big impact on microbial activity. And so biofilm is probably at least one answer to that type of limitation. And so we know biofilms can help retain water, they absorb nutrients, they protect against salinity and osmolarity changes and pH changes and nutrient availability and redox potentials. Um, and so in many ways, these ge uh, geochemical and geophysical constraints, the biofilm is a way to respond to those constraints. In addition, we know that biofilms can be protection against predation. And so this would be, a, there are a lot of uh, mic um, micro eukaryotes that, that actually um, are predators for, for bacteria. And so there's actually protection against predation um, in, within biofilm. And we can actually even think about this in the human system and actually um, is protection against immune cells. And so you have an immune system that can elicit response to the presence of microorganisms and there is some protection when they are in this biofilm mode. So that would be thinking about why, bio, why microbes exist as biofilms. This would, be, this would be multiple answers to that question. We also know that biofilms are an evolutionary adaptation to changing environments. And so this was probably one reason why they, they are evolutionarily ancient answer to the types of constraints that biological systems can experience. And in fact, um, there's been some recent work to suggest that we can think about these systems even where cooperation and differentiation were likely forged and selected. We know that, again, in the fossil record, we know that, that things that look like extinct microbial biofilms existed on early Earth. And this was probably a way for biological systems to forge this ability to cooperate with one another um, and get selected for it. And then in, a, in another recent paper by Hooper and Burstein, they posited actually that the minimization of extracellular space in a microbial biofilm, particularly ones that, ca that contained both bacteria and archaea, probably promoted cellular associations that impacted the metabolism of this overall, the overall metabolism of the biofilm and may have even contributed to the evolution of eukarya itself. And so these are some very interesting arguments for thinking about the role that biofilms played in the evolution of, of, of eukaryotes. And so another question that could be um, in reference to why biofilm is why should we study biofilm? And I hope I've gone through and, and what I'm going to try to do then in the, in the next sets of slides is to sort of show that because microbes are important on the planet, most of those microbes exist as biofilm. We should, be under, we should be studying them and understanding them when they're in that biofilm growth mode. And so this has very large impacts on both applied and fundamental microbiology, um, as well as synthetic biology and even thinking about in general how biological systems evolve to particular constraints. The, the groundwork for all of this was being laid, laid down a long time ago, and there's a lot that we have to learn about how biological systems behave and how they respond to constraints of the system. And so the, the title of the talk was Diversity and Ecology. And so part of that is, you know, where do we find these biofilms and, and, what, and, and who, who, who makes up, what organisms make up these biofilms? And so as I stated, microbial biofilms are present in almost all known microbial habitats. That includes the human body, and we're getting an increasingly, uh, uh, we're getting an increasing appreciation of the role that these microbes are playing on the human body. And they exist as multi-species communities that with extreme complexity. And so again, we cannot think about microbes as these single-celled, simple single-celled organisms because they, they have the ability to form these multicellular macroscopic structures that have very different types of behavior than what we think of as a single cell. So where, where are biofilms? And so some of the most studied habitats range from wastewater treatment to drinking water to marine surface water to industrial installations. Um, any type of industrial um, uh, processing plant and such is going to have uh, microbes a part of that ecosystem. Hospitals, rhizosphere, agricultural fields, mine water, subsurface soils, 
So lots of different environments, and this is just, this certainly isn't all inclusive, it's only naming examples of some of the, the better studied systems. And then we can go all the way to the human-centric environments that include oral, intestinal, skin, urinary, and respiratory systems. And, and I'll sort of round out the talk with, with thinking about how the microbiome has impacted our, our understanding of microbial biofilms in the human, on and in the human body. And so the investigation of biofilm structure and composition is well justified, and few other topics have as far-reaching implications for the challenges that face human society. And the, really, to me, the four big ones being water, food, energy, and health. And so water is going to involve microbes and microbial biofilms and how we process wastewater and how we clean it and how we keep our, how we keep our, our potable water clean. Certainly with food and thinking about nitrogen fixation and climate change and carbon fixation and fertilizers and how we process that fertilizer. Go back to the point that I raised about the majority of ni biological nitrogen and phosphorus on the planet is, is retained within the microbial world. We need that nitrogen and phosphorus to grow more food. And so that's going to have a big impact. The contribution of microbial biofilms there is going to be big. Energy, certainly thinking about our, our consumption of subsurface energy, as well as making bioenergy and alternative energy. Is going to, biofilms are going to play a role. And as I mentioned in, in uh, the, the, the microbiomes and the human health and the roles that, the, that microbes are playing in, in that arena as well. So I'm going to give just a smattering of, of some examples of this. And so in the, in the medical arena, um, I'll go through these examples here. We can think about chronic wounds. Um, for instance, a diabetic ulcer patient is going to have a chronic wound that won't heal. And some of some work that we do, and this is a heavily researched area across the world. What this is a this is thought of as a biofilm that's established in that chronic wound, and how it's interacting with the host cells, how it controls the movement of plasma and nutrients and oxygen content, and why is that wound not healing? And this would be an example, say, of a of a of a, a chronic ulcer or wound on on a foot that would be very common common in a diabetic patient. Um, certainly, um, moving over here to the right and thinking about the human oral cavity and the growth of dental plaque and gingivitis and dental caries and the role that microorganisms play in that environment. And um, it's actually one of the most, most studied microbial or uh, ecological, or one of the most studied microbial environments studied in, the, in respect to ecology and where we have a really good understanding of what's going on, but there's still a lot that we don't know. Then this, this graphic here down on the lower left is sort of giving an example of different environments um, that are studied around the world and, and how microbial biofilms can impact um, catheters of different systems, say artificial implants into the human body. Um, even in the mouth where we have an interface between a solid surface like the tooth enamel and liquid that's coming over that tooth enamel. These are all what I meant by phase boundaries. And these are great habitats that are going to be um, in, uh, environments for microbes to live. A contact lens is another example of this phase boundary of a solid surface that's going to be between where you're going to have liquid in between and you've got two, the surface of the eye and the surface of the contact lens and then the liquid in between. If these aren't kept clean or if these aren't replaced right or if you get a solution that's contaminated, this is a great place for biofilms to grow. This is looking at a, a, a different type of a wound where in, in this human body where we have a wound that won't heal and what's the role of biofilm and why it's not allowing the body to heal. And then again, as I mentioned, surgical implants. And this is another area of, of uh, research and understanding my unwanted microbial biofilms. We can move into surfaces around the home where some are obvious, say in the bathroom or in hot tubs or in other moist environments like a shower stall um, into the kitchen. But even then thinking about these surfaces of, of, say, a carpet and where you don't really think of them as a moist environment, but there certainly is enough moisture for microbes to grow. And, and there's a lot of work then trying to understand um, microbial biofilms in these types of environments. And I want to, this is a, a good point to raise. We typically think of a microbial biofilm as a big, snotty, slimy structure. And it doesn't always have to be that way. And so even when we think about an environment like this, this carpet that's being shown down in the lower right hand corner and that maybe we don't think of as a lot of free moisture in that there is moisture and particles of food and other debris that come into that environment and you're going to get microbes then growing on those surfaces and adhering to them and so these these in fact do become environments for microbial biofilms we can think of a wide array of natural environments and man-made structures that become home to microbial biofilms and so um, 
up here on the upper left and lower lower left, we can think about um, natural stream environments or where there's water. We have photo photo driven types of environments all the way to the thermal features within Yellowstone and the different types of map material we have. Those are those are technically biofilms. We can think of water cooling towers in industry or where wa our water water cooling apparatus where we're going to get um, liquid and solid interfaces and there's going to be food there for microbial biofilms to establish. This example up here are actually um, water lines from a dental office. And if you then take that tubing out, so these would be potable water distribution lines and you get formations of biofilm on, on the inside of these. Um, this is an example of a, of a kitchen drain sink. Obviously lots of different types of nutrients that are going to be coming through that environment and the types of biofilm that can establish. This would be an example of a, of a metal pipe or a, um, think of these commonly as in water and oil and gas distribution systems and a, a large problem is metal corrosion and bio, microbial biofilms play a big role in that. Food, process, food and food processing surfaces are another big area and I think it's going to be one that's going to really start to grow as we try to control foodborne pathogens and how food is processed in, the, in an industrial setting. Um, in this industrial setting that's being shown here, how can we control microbial biofilms? These are examples of household biofilms, and so this would be something that almost any of us can relate to. This would be of a, of a kitchen sink, and we can then move down, and then we use a stereo microscope at the center, and you can start to see then the biofilm that's going to be uh, at the biofilm that's going to be un underneath this drain within between the rubber stopper. You've got lots of moisture coming through, through lots of food and the establishment of a biofilm. This was be an example of an aerator that's in the, the faucet, a kitchen sink faucet, and microbes are going to start to establish and growth or start to establish and grow biofilm. This would be, say, a common kitchen sink sponge and the types of microbial biofilm that's grown within that sponge. And then here's a toothbrush, and you can look down at the base of that toothbrush and you start to see microbial biofilm growth or then even look at the base of these bristles here and you can start to then see microbial biofilm growth and, and it, it's going to happen and how do we then understand the, the, the events that are leading to this growth and how can we control it. So I want to go through that some different examples of where we find, find biofilm and what do we know about the ecology of these biofilms and I'm not going to go into microbial mats except for this one slide. And I wanted to mention microbial mats because they are a very well studied system and technically it's a biofilm. It's just going to be a, a much larger type of biofilm. And so these are evolutionarily ancient biofilms. These are the types of biofilms that probably we find fossil record for um, on ancient earth. They're vertically stratified, um, laterally compressed with different trophic groups of bacteria um, be along these geochemical boundaries or geophysical boundaries and how they establish themselves. So this is an example of a, of a microbial mat. This is very large as you can see and where you have phototrophs in the top and then you get probably fermentation and we get to more anaerobic metabolism and ultimately to sulfate reducers and iron reducers. And so this is an, a great example of a macroscopic microbial biofilm. And so we don't have to think of them as hard to see or big um, big slimy types of structures that, that are only can be grown in the lab, we can go out to the national, natural world and find examples of these microbial biofilms. And there's a lot to learn about how biology evolved in processing nutrients and cycling nutrients. I also wanted to mention um, algal fungal biofilms and so this is a, a growing area within the biofilm research area. And so we know that, that algal fungal biofilms are, are prevalent and important in lots of different natural and man-made environments. And in fact, um, some recent work has shown, and actually uh, um, recent uh, work actually back in the 90s has actually estimated that almost 20% of fungi um, are able to form symbiotic relationships with algae in, in things known as lichens. And so most people are familiar with lichens. And so almost 20% of fungi are in these types of relationships. And this is actually could be considered as an algal fungal biofilm. And we know that they play uh, very important roles in nutrient turnover as well as maintenance of biodiversity in lots of different environments. So this is work from a recent pub publication in 2016 
where you, they're starting to actually grow chlorella, which is an algae, and this mucor fungus, and understanding how they interact and grow as a biofilm. And then these slides down here at the bottom is work from the USGS, where they want to understand these photo-driven photo um, algal biofilms that you're going to see prevalent in lots of aquatic environments, um, and actually try to find ways to grow them in a lab in a tractable way to understand nutrient turnover in a mixed eukaryotic biofilm. This also leads then to this notion of exterior biofilms, and by exterior I'm really meaning sort of uh, exterior of, ma of man-made structures. And so we know that these types of structures are going to be inhabited by bacteria, algae, and fungi, and they can cause aesthetic as well as physical damage, um, but they also can, can contribute to health issues. And so there's a lot of work, or I should say a lot of upcoming work about the, the built environment on the outside and the interior of the, of the, of the building, and how mixed microbial biofilms play a role in that environment. And so this was a recent paper that I'm citing here in 2014 where and they looked at um, uh, different cyanobacterial populations that were predominating building facades in India. And actually a few years ago then there was some uh, work done by Polo et al, which uh, is some, some work that uh, we have some, we have, there's a colleagues of ours in Italy. And they've been looking at this notion of, or this ability of green algae and black fungi to dominate biofilms on motor, mortar and stone buildings. And they actually found that the mortar used for restoration of, of these ancient or uh, uh, historically re uh, relevant buildings, the, the restorative uh, compound that's used contains acrylic and siloxane, and that these actually turn, turn out to be used as carbon and energy sources for the microorganisms and actually help grow the biofilm. And I put this picture here of the Jefferson Memorial. There's been some recent uh, news in the uh, news articles uh, on the web and by the Washington Post where they're interested in some of this fungal algal biofilm that's actually starting to deteriorate the, the Jefferson Memorial. So this would be another place, another important role that, um, detrimental role that, that mixed species biofilms are playing in man-made environments. Now we also have environments in the subsurface. Um, if you can imagine the, the, even the top kilometer of, of the Earth's crust, and think of that as the subsurface of the soil, there's a lot of microbial biomass there, and those microbes are, are adhered to the, surf, the soil um, as a biofilm. And there, there's a lot of interest in understanding what they do and ro what role they play in carbon turnover for the, um, for the planet. So what I'm mentioning here now is, and what I'm showing is subsurface biofilms and energy because in my lab we study um, coal bed methane. And we know that there are coal seams, deep coal seams, and that they produce natural gas. And a significant portion of that natural gas is actually being actively made by a microbial, pop, by a microbial community, actually. And we know that what's happening is that microbial community is interacting with the coal and actually adhering to it and using that as a carbon source that ultimately gets broken down into natural gas. And then energy companies harvest the water out of the ground, they collect that natural gas, and they can sell it as an energy source. And so we're, we've been interested actually in, in these subsurface coal biofilms and creating a field site in eastern Montana in conjunction with the USGS to understand the distribution of these coal biofilms um, at different levels. And so just to give an example of this is the type of work that you have to go out at these field sites. You have wells in the ground and we can pump water and then we can put down samplers into these wells and allow the microorganisms to, in essence, inhabit the coal and form biofilms on that coal so that we can then bring them back up to the surface and study them. So these are just examples of graduate students at our field site um, outside of Bertie, Montana. And this is actually water being collected as we pump it out of those wells and all of that bubble um, all of those bubbles are actually the methane gas that's being produced by microorganisms. And so we can, we can drill, um, so as being shown here in this slide at our field site, these are showing different wells and these wells go to different depths. Um, and when we develop those wells then we have the core material and out of these coal materials, out of these core materials, we can then assess microbial communities as they're distributed through this material. And you can then see this, this would be an example of the mixing from a sandstone into the coal material. And we can ask, what, did the bio, what are the, the microbial biofilm communities look like on that coal material? 
And we can actually then start to assess which populations are being are predominating at with coal material and which microbial populations are more common in the in the sandstone areas. And so with the with the idea that we want to understand what microbes are present with that coal, how are they degrading that coal, and how does that impact the overall ability of methanogenesis? And so in essence, we're 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 looking at subsurface microbial biofilms how they turn over recalcitrant carbon in the terrestrial subsurface and how this ultimately then links in with the global carbon cycle. Another area that microbial biofilms are very important are, and I, as I mentioned is this in one of the previous slides, that picture of the corroding metal pipeline. And so metal corrosion um, is is very big problem, uh, particularly in water distribution and gas distribution and petroleum hydrocarbon distribution. And so corrosion is a relatively simple electrochemical process that involves matching electrochemicals processes between the oxidation of a metal at the anode and a parallel chemical reduction at the cathode. And microorganisms actually help complete this circuit and carry out metal corrosion. And so we know that microbial biofilms can actually help accelerate the corrosion process. And in some instances, they can actually help retard it by actually covering and protecting the metal from sort of from chemical chemical re, um, oxidation or should say chemical redox reactions. So this is an image from a, a, a review paper that was written by Dennis Enning et al. in 2012. And this, let me go back and get my marker. So this material here is the microbial biofilm and these are microbial cells. And so what's happening is that they actually will get um, organic carbon and electron sources from the bulk phase. They can also then strip that out of the metal surface. And in this case, we're showing sulfate reducers. And so they'll take those electrons and reduce sulfate to sulfide, which itself um, is a corrosive agent. And this can also then produce iron sulfides then that reside on the metal. And so this, this microbial process then is helping to eat away at the metal surface, actually millimeters per year. And that can play a very strong role in corroding and finally having pipeline failure. This is, this is a, a SEM image of actual metal surface where we grow metal biofilms, and these are the start to be the corrosive pits that these microbes will form. Now, a lot of the times, sulfate-reducing bacteria have been uh, typically been studied as culprits in this, but through um, microbial ecology, these biofilms were finding out that there's also actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, firmicutes, proteobacteria, um, as well as other sulfate-reducing bacteria, sulfide-oxidizing bacteria, as well as methanogens. We're starting to appreciate the diversity of the different microbes in these biofilms and the role they play in microbial corrosion. This is an example of some work that we've done at the Center for Biofilm Engineering where we've taken a sulfate reducing bacterium and grew it under different nutrient conditions. These are actually biofilms on metal surfaces and you can start to see the formation of these, um, of these different minerals. And so what, what type of biofilm it, I should say the, the conditions that the biofilm is grown under will dictate the amount of corrosion and the types of mineral precipitates that are being formed. We can, and when I say the, diff the amounts of corrosion, we can actually use a, um, a potentiostat and poise these metal surfaces and get a measurement of electrical current. And we know that under certain conditions, we can actually um, increase metal corrosion. And in other conditions, at, at different points in time, we can um, have a decrease in metal corrosion. We've also been this graph here is in conjunction or in collaboration with Gary Zuzdak at the Scripps Institute, where we've now been applying metabolomics to try to understand what are the different chemical metabolites in these biofilms and how do they contribute to the overall corrosion rate. I mentioned in an earlier slide that biofilms are important for wastewater treatment. This has been a this has had a, new, a huge impact on humans on human society in the last hundred or so years on our ability to treat our wastewater and clean it up. And so biofilm is very important in that. And so typically in the wastewater environment, um, you would see this referred to as flocks or granules or aggregates. These are in essence uh, types of biofilms. And we have mixed species in these biofilms that are very essential to turn over the organic waste in reference to the organic carbon, the nitrogen, and the phosphorus that's there. And so ultimately, municipal water can be treated and then can be released back into the environment. 
So there's been a this is a, a there's been a lot of work in this area to understand how how microbes are interacting to carry out this process that we're interested in. Um, at a at a phylo level or a subphylo level, we know that beta proteobacteria are seen are observed commonly, as well as Bacteroidetes, Acetobacteria, and Chloroflexi, as well as then these uh, in a, this particular review by these authors this year, highlighting these different microbial groups that play important roles in wastewater treatment, and then this Ascomycota. Um, is actually a, um, a eukaryote that's involved in interacting with these different microbes for wastewater treatment. And one thing that's been interesting in, in these different papers that have come out, and I'm trying to understand biofilm, is, is that we're seeing that biofilm structures are actually related to the treatment process. And so depending upon what type of biofilm is there in the treatment facility, and there's lots of different ways to treat wastewater, and there's different stages of wastewater treatment, as you can see down here in this typical wastewater treatment facility. If we're starting to see that um, the biofilm is present and the microbes that are present in that biofilm is going to have a big impact on the treatment process and how well the carbon and the nitrogen and phosphorus are treated. This means that as we learn how to control the ecology, we're going to be able to control the process better. We're going to be able to make it more stable and more efficient and actually ultimately get the desired nitrogen cycling that we wanted. So this is another big area of biofilm research is in the wastewater treatment area. So this is an example of some of the work that we've been doing in the wastewater area. And so um, I have a graduate student that's been looking at the wastewater lagoon system um, uh, at, in Logan, Utah. This is one of the largest municipal wastewater lagoons in the country. It's 460 acres and holds about 900 million gallons of water. And so for reference of these wastewater lagoon systems, this the, the bottom here is being shown in that it's one mile in length and that what what this diagram is showing is that here's where the influent comes into the wastewater lagoons. It moves into these two A ponds, which then moves into its respective B. They, those two come into C and then into D and then to E. And this is where the, the effluent is. And ultimately, when you have water down here is where you want to have all, uh, low organic carbon, low nitrogen, and low phosphorus so that water can be released into the environment. And so we were curious then on what does the, the, the biofilm ecology or the aggregates look like in these different ponds as we move between uh, through the lagoon, different ponds in that system? And we actually were able to, to track um, bacterial diversity, archaeal diversity, and um, bac bacterial, archaeal, eukarya, and actually the double-stranded viruses that, that um, infect the algal component of that community. And so we know, for instance, that the algal diversity remains low and shows the least amount of variation over time. And I should mention that when we sampled these ponds, we were in the surface water. And so this isn't surprising because I think most of the algal diversity will probably be in the sediments that are settling at the bottom of that of those lagoon systems. We know that the eukaryal diversity um, um, demonstrated a little fluctuation, but through the ponds. Um, but it has higher diversity depending upon what pond system you're in. And so this probably has something to do with the flux of nutrient in those, in those particular ponds. We know that bacterial diversity fluctuates way more and actually was highest in particular ponds B, D, and E. And these are actually some of the ponds where we have the lowest eukaryal diversity. And so this starts to give you some insight into potential competition between very high level um, microbial groups that are fighting for, that new, for those nutrients that you want to turn over. And ultimately, we had the highest diversity measures and variation in the double-stranded DNA viruses, particularly the ones that impacted vir uh, algae. And so what we're trying to do is now is take all of that data and estimate, um, create, cre or estimate a food network. These are basically population networks that where we're trying to understand positive and negative correlations or interactions between different microbial groups within these aggregates and biofilms and what how do they impact nutrient recycling in this given environment? And this is a very common line of work that's, that's um, in wastewater treatment right now. Another environment um, is groundwater biofilms, and this is another area that we look at in trying to understand how, how uh, biofilms on these sediments are impacted by groundwater as they move through a very large landscape scale. And so um, this is an example of where we drop um, sediment samples into these wells so that we can then get an idea of the groundwater flowing through these and how biofilms that form on those sediments 
compare between those that environment and the water and the water that's actually moving through and trying to identify again particular populations that are enriched in these different environments and relate that then to the activity that they're carrying out in that environment. This is a common back to water. This is a, a work that was done in 2014 and understanding um, the formation of water that's in premise plumbing. This is the plumbing that's moving drinking water in houses and how in this paper they compared unplasticized PVC to actually copper piping and how the microbial biofilms were different and then how those biofilms responded to um, the introduction of a particular pathogen, say like Legionella. And so this is an area of work and then what they found was that different material had different drinking water biofilms, but they both were able to resist the infection of Legionella, which then will help us build better materials for and understand premise plumbing and how we move drinking water around. This is another area of research, and this, this paper was done in 2009 in showerhead biofilms, and they actually found particular microbes that were inhabiting these, these biofilms. Of interest was the, the identification of microspecies bacteria, which have been related to pulmonary disease. And whether you have um, municipal drinking water or if you're on well water, they found the incidence of these microbacteria different. So that's another uh, in, uh, active area of research. This was another interesting paper of Flores 2013, where they were actually tracking um, biofilms in the different kitchen environments. And ultimately, they found that the human skin was the primary source for all surfaces with some contamination of food in the faucet, uh, faucet water, as you would suspect. And so thinking about then all the different surfaces in an environment like the kitchen and how we interact with that environment and, and interchange microbial biofilms between, the, between those environments. And so I want to wrap up then thinking about the human microbiome, which has been an active area of research, and thinking about microbial biofilms, whether we're talking about the stomach or the intestines or the mouth or the skin. So this was an interesting work that came out this year of looking at dental plaque and trying to identify uh, healthy um, organ, uh, individuals with sort of a uh, healthy oral activity and ones that were more in a disease state. And they could identify then um, these, these microbial populations with healthy individuals and then more in, a, in an unhealthy state, Porphomonas, Tanarelia, Treponema, and Eubacterium. Human skin is another active area of understanding biofilm growth, and we can, we can think of the human body and the largest organ being one and a half to two meters square, square meters of, of surface area and all the microbes that are on that. And what you're show, shown here is 3D imaging of individual body spots and, and looking at the distribution of Staphylococcus, Propionibacterium, and Cordybacterium and the prevalence of those microbial populations at different spots in the human body. And, that, and again, that paper came out last year in 2015. And then the, the role that those organisms play in, in maintaining healthy skin and, and disease states of the skin. This is an active area of research and could be considered biofilm. And then lastly, the, the, one of the more um, actively studied areas in the human body is the, obviously the intestinal biofilm. We know that there's over a thousand microbial species there dominated by these five micro, uh, bacterial phyla with some archaea, mainly methanogens, and eukarya being driven by yeast. We know that the number of genes contained in the gut microflora greatly outnumbers even the genes in our own genome. We know that these, these intestinal biofilms um, help facilitate nutrients, they synthesize vitamins, they stimulate the immune system, they maintain low numbers of pathogens. There's been some work to show that there's a link between irritable bowel syndrome, obesity, diabetes, arteriosclerosis, and colorectal cancer. And so, for example, in, in DeVos 2015, they actually talked about this, for instance, this one organism that's a mucin degrader and that it developed specific interactions with host cells. And in a mouse study, it actually protected the host from a, a diet-induced obesity. And so mucin is the, the, uh, the, is the, the slime that's produced by your intestinal cells and how microbes interact with that and the role that that plays in an overall health of the individual. And so with that, I want to wrap up and, and, and hopefully uh, gave a breadth of different places we find biofilms, why biofilms is important, and what do we know thus far about who's in those biofilms. This is a, a picture of a lot of the folks at the center. Um, so again, as I mentioned, we're an interdisciplinary research center with lots of different experts in different areas. And then this is my research group and, and work in my uh, lab is, is currently funded by the Department of Energy, the uh, NSF, and NIH. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Matthew Fields, for that informative presentation. It's now time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Fields, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the send button. We will answer as many questions that we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is, Dr. Fields, when differing biofilm communities encounter each other, does anything happen at the interface? Great question. Oh. Okay, and so that's a, a great question and it's probably one that we don't have a, a lot of information on. We do know that there's a lot of communication between populations within a biofilm and so I think the same would hold true for a, a given intact biofilm as it, incorpor as it uh, um, came into contact with another biofilm. I think there's going to be lots of interaction and communication and we can think about that as, as potential uh, cooperation and and potential competition and how and so there's a lot of uh, active areas of research trying to understand those interactions um, and yes I think it would and so the second part of that question is um, or no I think hopefully that answers that question I think hopefully that answers that question <laughs> Question. Do different bacterial strains generate different types of biofilm? And if so, does this impact the stability of the biofilm? Yes, definitely different bacterial strains generate uh, different types of biofilm. Um, they uh, biofilms will differ um, depending upon what organism they are, what genus or species, or even the strain, as you mentioned. Um, they'll be very tight, small biofilms. We get very big, thick biofilms. It and that, that really is dependent upon the, the population or populations that makes up that biofilm and what they're actively eating and the nutrients they have available to them. And then so the second part of your question was about stability, and definitely that will impact stability. Um, different microbes make different types of structures um, that they use to sort of uh, fortify and strengthen that biofilm matrix and, and how they interact in it. Um, and so, yes, it will definitely impact the stability of that as well. Next question. How do you sample and study the different microenvironments present in mature biofilms particularly multi-species biofilms. Oh. So, um, so there are def definitely microenvironments within um, within the biofilm, and work that's being done right now is to try to actually. Uh, use microelectrodes, and so these are tiny electro electrodes that say try to measure different chemical constituents, um, maybe maybe redox, maybe pH, and to try to understand in this very heterogeneous biofilm matrix at a very micro, you know, say 10 micron scale, what that's how we sort of get at measuring an intact biofilm and start to pick apart those micro those micro niches. When we think about uh, multi-species biofilms, yes, and, then, and, and even, even for a monoculture biofilm, this is a biofilm made by one organism, say it's like Pseudomonas that I showed in my talk, there will probably even be uh, micro niches and heterogeneity within that monoculture biofilm, meaning I could have a population of Pseudomonas cells over here that are doing one thing, and, they, and a, pop, a subpopulation of Pseudomonas cells over here that are doing something very different. And so even, even within a monoculture and certainly within a multi-species biofilm then, you try to then use microelectrodes and get at these different micro niches. You can start to do things like uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization that targets um, different um, ribosomal RNA genes or different mRNA genes um, to get at subpopulations within that biofilm. And then people are trying to develop um, flow cytometry and actually micro, say, uh, micro droplet technology where we can get that biofilm and actually get individual cells picked out of it 
and ask what are those different cells, who are they, and what are they doing, and how does that contribute to the heterogeneity that's, that we find in the biofilm. Dr. Fields, in, in a laboratory, why do some sugar, uh, let me rephrase this, in laboratory, why does some sugar induce biofilm formation but others won't? So why some sugars would induce biofilm formation and others won't, um, I think a lot of that work's probably been done on, on, a, on, a hand, on certain bacteria, particularly pathogens. I think what happens is, is that some sugars promote a more capsular material, and so that capsular material um, helps, the, um, helps contribute to the overall matrix of the biofilm, and so maybe some sugars promote the, the production of a capsule while others don't. It might have something to do with um, uh, different sugars are actually utilized by different microorganisms. Some may not be utilized at all, and so whether you have growth or not would dictate whether you have biofilm or not. It might also have something to do with, uh, say, if we're talking about gram-negative bacteria um, with an uh, LPS, and depending upon what sugars are being produced, an organism might modify the sugars that they're putting on the ends of their of their LPS, and that might have a uh, that might have an impact on their ability to interact with each other and to interact with certain surfaces. So that would be my my first uh, my first guess at that question. Next question: Have any biofilms been discovered in the nuclear industry? Um, so I'd have to go out to the literature and look. Um, as far as in connected to the nuclear energy, I can say that um, one area of, the, of work that we uh, study, when I mentioned the groundwater and subsurface, micro, uh, subsurface biofilms, is understanding uh, uranium contamination. And so this was uranium waste um, from the Manhattan Project. And that's uh, you know, obviously long-term stored waste and that we have to deal with the movement of those heavy metals and we're trying to find ways to use microorganisms to mediate that bioremediation project. Um, I think if you went into the nuclear ind industry on cooling towers um, and cooling water, you would definitely find probably biofilm issues um, for heat transfer and how bi microbial biofilms are impacting that. And so I think that would be another area that um, would impact the, the nuclear industry. We have time for one more question. As you noted in your introduction, biofilms can form on biotic as well as abiotic surfaces. How do you model or grow in the lab biofilms that typically grow on biotic surfaces, for example, teeth or the human colon? Um, so two, two examples that I can think of, particularly the ones that you mentioned, teeth would be a great example of, of a, a biological solid surface. And so um, some people have actually used uh, real teeth um, to grow biofilms on, but probably what even more commonly we can use a, um, appetite um, or other types of hard material that has a very similar mineral structure to say enamel and dentine and actually uh, uh, make a thin sheet of that type of material and then grow biofilm in reactors um, on that type of material. And another example that you mentioned was say like on the intestinal cells. And so there has been growing work to actually grow, um, this is a, a new developing area of, of a, you can differentiate a human cell, say a human cell line to then grow the what are called organoids. And you can cause them to differ differentiate into a particular organ that you are interested in. And so for instance, in this case, uh, an intestinal mucosal cell. And then you can actually then inject that cell with um, say a, a microbial community that looks like a, that comes from a human intestinal uh, sample and actually watch how that cell interacts. And so that would be a, another example. And one more that I can mention is um, the, there's a huge growth area in studying um, the human skin microbiome. So you can actually grow, say, keratinocytes 
um, in cell culture and then how, look at how microorganisms grow on top of those keratinocytes. You can actually take that cell culture of keratinocytes and actually mimic sort of a scratch or a wound. And so you scratch that, that, that cell culture plate and then and you, there's no cells there. And you can actually watch how the keratinocytes grow back together and what role the skin microbiome plays in that. Dr. Fields, we're going to squeeze in one more question. Do microbes and biofilm react differently in zero gravity on ISS, for example? My, my guess is that, that, that there would be some differences. And so I don't know. I know that there's a little bit in the scientific literature where folks have taken some bacterial cultures on space shuttle missions and onto the International Space Station, um, and they've and they've sort of tried to decipher how the biological cell is responding to that microgravity um, environment. I don't know if anyone has specifically done that with biofilm, and and certainly poises a, a interesting question. Thank you once again, Dr. Matthew Fields. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing until December 7th, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again. Bye.